Welcome back, everyone. Uh, for those of you who have not met me before, my name is Christoph Straub, and I'm the Industry Programming Manager here at TEF. Uh, on behalf of the Industry Office, I'd like to welcome you to our final session of the day. Um, before I introduce the, ses the session, I'd like to thank one more time the D Directors Guild of Canada for supporting our industry initiatives here at this festival, but also throughout the year. Uh, also, just a reminder that tomorrow at noon we have a higher learning panel on the rules of engagement, documentary filmmaking in Canada. This is a free event as part of our, our higher learning series, so you can pick up your ticket tomorrow at the box office for free and just enjoy a great panel. And of course, screenings for Canada's top 10 film festival are going on all throughout uh, until the end of the week end. In earlier sessions today, we put a spotlight on the new generation of Canadian filmmakers and explored the current boom of cinematic television. And that last se session was actually is kind of directed to uh, directly connected to this session here. We're now turning our attention to the topic of digital distribution. As most of you know, 2014 saw a steep decline in movie going attendance in North America, a low point in actually in 20 years. Now, while we know that there always have been ups and downs and things. The numbers will go up again this year for sure. One thing is also clear that on audiences in Canada and the US for movies increasingly tend to choose other platforms than theaters. Television continues, of course, to be a dominant force, but platforms such as Netflix, iTunes, and there are a plethora of others are powerful players and becoming preferred channels for more and more Canadians to watch movies in this new digital democracy. So with this in mind, we decided to invite a number of experts and executives from the film industry to explore the challenges and opportunities that the current shifts in the distribution landscape uh, re represent to the various constituents of the Canadian film industry. Some of the questions addressed in this panel, but not all of them, include how do Canadian broadcasters, content producers and filmmakers respond to adjust uh, or adjust to changing viewing habits of Canadian audiences? Do filmmakers still need traditional sales agents and distributors to sell and release their films, given that they can negotiate deals with online platforms in territories all around the world themselves? What kind of mechanisms need to be put in place to protect and support Canadian film and television producers at the same, by, while at the same time giving audiences and consumers what they want? Well, I'll leave it at that, uh, but now I just want to briefly introduce our expert uh, panel of experts. Please join me in welcoming Janet Brown, the CEO of New York City-based distribution outfit Cinetic Rights Management and Film Buff. We have here with us today Dave Forche, the Director of Business Affairs and Certification at Telefilm Canada. Michael Hennessy, the President and CEO of the Canadian Media Production Association. And for Michael, I'll mention that some of you may know this, but uh, the CMPA puts on a fantastic event in, at the beginning of March in Ottawa called Primetime in Ottawa. So make sure that you check that event out because what you're seeing here tonight and what you saw all day, there is more of that at Primetime as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, moving on, we have Naveen Prasad, the Executive Vice President and General Manager of Elevation Pictures. And Tim Southam, the president of the Directors Guild of Canada and a filmmaker in his own right. His credits include the films The Bay of Love and Sorrows, The One Dead Indian, or uh, series, TV series, episodes in TV series such as House, Bones, and Bates Motel. Woo! Tim. <laughs> Tim also brought, brought his own fan club. <laughs> and last but not least, yeah, <laughs> it's a lot. <laughs> and last but not least, our moderator, Mary Madiver, the publisher of Playback Magazine and Strategy and the Vice President and Editorial Director of Brunica Communications, where she oversees journalistic policy and procedures for the company's editorial brands. And with that, I'll hand it over to Mary and thank you so much for taking the reins, Mary. Thank you, Christoph. Hello. Can, oh, there we go. People can hear me now. So, uh, as Christoph mentioned, uh, people going to the movies has gone down, but on the other hand, um, home entertainment uh, spending on the digital side has gone up 30% in the U.S. in the last year alone. Um, that sounds good, but overall, it's down 1.8%. So, those digital dollars aren't quite making up the, the physical ones um, yet. Uh, where is it being felt the most? Uh, DVDs, 11% decline. As you can imagine, the video store is down 27%, and 
in a very similar number, Netflix is up 26. So we can see what happened there. Um, the VOD category, strangely, down nearly 6.7%. And Canada, we're usually in the same realm as America, except, you know, only at 9 to 12% of the volume. Um, so we have those numbers to consider. And also what's happening next. In the next five years, according to various research, we're going to see a whole lot more people going strictly to, to internet streaming for their content. Um, a Netherlands-based uh, company did a survey recently of the US and various parts of Europe, and they came up with a figure of 40% of 18 to 34 year olds getting most of their content that way. Um, that's not actually as high as some other surveys, but <laughs> it certainly shows that, uh, that there is a tipping trend. And of course, Sony Pictures making $31 million on the interview in their online sales um, obviously shows what can happen if you, you get enough buzz going. Um, they only made $5 million at the theaters, but of course, we know they had a little bit of problem with getting people in the theaters. Um, it doesn't make up the amount of the actual cost of the film. Close, but not quite $44 million. Um, but they did get almost a quarter of a million new subscribers to their YouTube channel. So you see how this begins to build and grow. Um, so now we're going to dive into what it all means to Canada. Um, but at first I thought I'd share some thoughts uh, that were gathered for Playback's uh, year-end issue from some key people in the industry about what the challenge is ahead, because that's what we're going to be discussing today. Um, Mark Bishop of Marble Media, citing OTT, said it's important that the new platforms invest in CanCon. Um, and that may or may not be a popular sentiment with the panel, but also the producers be proactive about collaborating with broadcasters to re redefine how old new media models work together. And I think we want to talk about that in monetizing today. And Maria Topolovic, who heads up the Screen Composers Guild, also said collaboration was key. All stakeholders, creators, publishers, producers, broadcasters, ISPs, and government live in an ecosystem and rely on each other. We have to find a sustainable fair environment for all to thrive. Uh, it may be a little bit Pollyanna, but it's a good place to start off the debate, so let's take a stab at it. First, I'm gonna ask everybody to introduce themselves a little bit more and to tell you which film they last saw, where they saw it, what kind of a device they saw it on, and how they heard about it, just to give us a sense of how things are tipping even here. Start with you. Oh, thank you very much. Uh uh, my name is Dave Forget. I'm uh, I work over at Telefilm, and uh, what I do there is uh, look after Telefilm's programs as well as those of the Canada Media Fund, and uh, so that it's not so daunting. The certification part in my job title um, is um, Telefilm oversees the administration of 54 um, audiovisual co-production treaties with partners internationally, which is an opportunity for obviously for Canadians to produce. Uh, with other jurisdictions. So that's part of uh, what I do. Um, so great to be here. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, to answer your question, I'm going to start by cheating. I'm going first. I'm going to permit myself that. Uh, it's not quite a film, but I saw Book of Negroes last night, the first episode. It was developed by Telefilm. Uh, Dan Lyons here, he knows the answer to this. It was developed by Telefilm as a feature film. And I think it might be pertinent to mention it because we're seeing um, the... Um, the blurring of lines between content that's intended as feature and becomes miniseries or uh, a single a few episode series. So uh, that's mine. At, in terms of feature films, um, my other choice would be, I'm going to cheat twice and give myself two, uh, Le Petit Reine was a Quebec film I saw. Uh, I'm hoping the filmmaker's not in the room because I saw it on an airplane. Um, it's a, I highly recommend it. Um, and that was my second film. Thank you. Hey, I'm Janet. I run Film Buff. Uh, we're based in New York, and uh, we try and find awesome content and bring it to audiences everywhere. Um, we do specialize in bringing it to audiences on digital platforms, so we work with everyone, whether it's iTunes, Xbox, Comcast, Netflix, Hulu, uh, or here, Bell, Rogers, Shaw, everyone. Um, so I am definitely predisposed to see content on the small screen. I'm also predisposed because I recently had a baby. So I went to the theater exactly once in 2014 for non-work related theater going. Um, and I saw Boyhood, uh, which I'm assuming everyone has seen. 
um, and we will see how it how its chances fare. Um, but the last movie I saw was Blue is the Warmest Color, which I totally missed last year with all the hype, and I saw it on Netflix. Um, and the last movie I saw on TVOD, I saw on iTunes, which was that mainstream crowd pleaser chef. And I saw that because I went to New Orleans over the holidays, and they featured that crazy donut place. But that's a different story. You can pick that up later. Over to you. <laughs> Three stars for chef, right? Yeah. <laughs> if you're nice. So, Michael Hennessy, um, I head up the Canadian Media Producers Association. Um, that's uh, about 350 um, independent uh, film and TV producers. Uh, most of the film producers now are becoming convergent into television. Good news is, in terms of, of film, a couple of, 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 I think, good news bits. One, um, the actual expenditure on film last year in terms of production expenditure was up almost 5%, um, you know, not off a big number because film now is down to maybe about, you know, 15% of what uh, TV is, uh, but still uh, in, incredibly steady. And we saw lots of, there's a lot more private investment coming into film on the, uh, on the English side. So uh, some good stuff there. I saw, wha I saw whack of movies through December, so I'm trying to sort them all in my, my head, but, um, you know, like Imitation Game. I saw it at, at Whistler and Guardians of the Galaxy, a great movie. Um, so it was, it was a great movie. It's Star Wars and um, Raiders of the Lost Ark wrapped and together. Where did you see it? I saw it in my hotel room. Um, uh, but the, uh, you know, I saw Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy on, uh, on um, Netflix, uh, which is, you know, and, and it, the cinema, it's a beautiful cinematic movie, right? The, the quality was great. But the one that sort of stood out that, that month was uh, seeing Big Muddy, which is a Saskatchewan production um, at, uh, at Whistler um, on, a, on a bigger screen. And, you know, that was, a, it's a sort of film noir, um, Coen Brothers type movie. Um, just beautiful cinematography. Uh, really dark, you know, but that kind of dark, black, twisted, almost funny if you have a twisted brain, which which I do. Um, and, you know, I would say, like, for anybody that wants to know, are we making good movies in this country? Like, check that out. It is it is surprisingly good, and Nadia Litz, the actress in it, is, is stunning. So there you go. Thank you. Naveen? Uh, hi. Uh, Naveen from Elevation Pictures. I oversee uh, distribution for our... Uh, our slate of films, as well as oversee uh, some original television productions that we're uh, also doing. Uh, one of our films that are in theaters right now, The Imitation Game, so thank you. But you should have seen it in the theater so that, to pay for a movie ticket. Let's get those numbers back up. Um, I was with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, last film I saw was uh, actually last night, uh, and it was on iTunes, and I bought it because it was $9.99. It was The Doors, uh, the, uh, the Oliver Stone film. Uh, outside of that, the film that I've probably seen the most this year is because of my kids on Netflix, and it's that's been despicable with me. And I've seen that film a lot. Um, um, at at uh, Elevation, we're, uh, we're, we're doing about 20 to 25 films a year, you know, four to five Canadian films a year. At least that's the plan. We, we recently started. Uh, our first film was Nightcrawler, uh, that we, as a full-fledged company, releasing on our own across all rights of Nightcrawler. A few months ago, uh, we see that there's a lot of opportunity for distribution in Canada, both for foreign content and homegrown Canadian films. And uh, we're really excited to be in this space. Um, yeah. uh, I'm Tim. Um, uh, I spend most of my year directing uh, either films or television. Uh, in listening to my bio, I realize most of my films I directed 10 years ago and most of my television I've directed last week. Uh, so the, for in my life, there's a clear trend from, uh, you know, from long, well, from feature filmmaking to really interesting uh, series uh, directing. And I think that may be true of many of our members. Um, uh, and yet I detect in our membership and in my own heart, of course, a constant yearning to loop back to uh, starting a film starting a film on whatever platform will take it. Um, so I think I can speak fairly persuasively about where the aspirations of our membership lie. But what we do in addition to uh, advocating for filmmakers uh, at the policy level, Canadian filmmakers in Ottawa, is we also, with uh, our colleagues, the producers, model uh, contracts based on what's happening in the industry. And one of the most exciting experiences I've had 
recently, and I'm not sure that uh, I'm not sure the producers felt the same way. Was modeling uh, a new contract for uh, digital production only? That's say that, that is to say productions that are designed just for the digital space, which it's at, at present is a completely theoretical e- exercise because we can't really think of any productions that uh, exist only in that space. Uh, Almost everything ends up with a TV sale or, uh, or, or ends up looking for a theatrical uh, outlet. But it was very interesting to imagine that space uh, from a contractual point of view. And in terms of, um, and so I'll only be speaking about what's in the hearts and minds of my colleagues. And I've called a lot of them and talked to them. And we talk all the time about what it is to, to start a film, to make a film, and, or to work as a gigging director on other people's stuff. Uh, in terms of... Um, in terms of what I've watched, I watched uh, the, the last film I watched in a cinema was Monsoon, Sterla Gunnarsson's fantastic uh, uh, documentary here in this building. Incredible film. Um, uh, paradoxically, uh, I watched Boyhood at Home on my 4K TV, which was a very good experience, except for the $20 I had to pay for it on iTunes, which uh, I think we should talk about. If we're going to fight against piracy, maybe we should get a little help at the price point, too. Um, and, uh, you know, the paradox is that I watched the first episode of Book of Negroes in this uh, cinema as well uh, because the Directors Guild did a sort of an early screening of, of the Book of Negroes episode one in here and it looked absolutely fabulous. So uh, we, we know convergence, all of our members know convergence has happened technologically, we know it's happening economically, and we're just trying to figure out how to make, make it work for us creatively. Thank you. So you guys aren't quite uh, indexing the same way that Telefilm Research did (laughs) based on uh, the stats that uh, Carol Brabant gave us at uh, Christmas with her with her New Year's wish list. She said over 75 percent of films viewed by Canadians are now watched at home, making TV by far the most widely used platform for films with streaming next in line. Um, So I'm going to ask the panel now, what's the degree of change in consumer behavior over the past five years? Have we tipped? Are we tipping? When will we tip? And how do we compare to the U.S. in terms of impact? Given that, you know, we have relative differences in terms of what constitutes BOFO at box office, are we hit even a little bit less hard? And and what do you see happening next? I'm going to turn this over to you, Janet, first. Well, you know, in preparation for this, I was looking through uh, some of our numbers. So we are based in New York, but we distribute content around the world. So I was looking at how, what the trends are in terms of numbers we're seeing with our releases in the States versus Canada versus other countries. Um, And I think one of the words that's come up that um, people might not be sure what it means is streaming. so we define the market that we're focused on digitally in two different ways. So there's transactional VOD, which is if you go to iTunes and pay to rent it for like $4.99 or $5.99, that's renting. If you download it, it's the price point that Tim just referred to. Well, that's an early buy price point, but it tends to be like $15, $16, $25 is EST. Both of those are what I call TVOD, transactional VOD. Um, and the alternative to that is what people call SVOD or subscription VOD, which tends to be equated with Netflix, but also in the States there's Amazon Prime, which is another viable one, as well as Hulu Plus. So looking at the trends, what we have seen um, in Canada, even more so than in the States, is a real slowdown in TVOD um, that is happening and an almost doubling in terms of SVOD. So our, but our films are different from say Naveen's. They're uh, like most of our films have a limited to small theatrical um, and uh, companies like Elevation are gonna focus on films that always have a theatrical and a significant one, I would say. Um, so we're really focused. Some, a lot of our content goes theatrical, but not all. But I thought that was an interesting trend to share. And in TVOD, we do pretty consistently see that Canada is around 11%, at least in terms of our numbers, of of US. That fraction isn't changing, but the growth rate in TVOD is definitely slowing down. What's interesting is that it's increasing in the rest of the world, um, but it's slowing down in Canada. um, And that the rest of the world is increasing, at least for us anyway, even faster in SVOD than than Canada is. Um, So that's live data from the front, guys. Um, <laughs> we, we, we release between five and 10 films a month, and the majority of those 
are, uh, are at least U.S. and Canada, and a lot of them are worldwide. So we have a lot of data points um, that we look at, and we use that data to help determine what films we're going to work on in the first place. And in terms of projecting forward, what sort of, uh, what do you see in five years? Like, what do you think in terms of this whole audience tipping thing? Well, I, I, from our point of view, and, and again, unlike everyone else sitting up here, I don't live and work primarily in Canada. Um, but from our point of view, I think the independent space, which is what I do predominantly work in, um, is definitely bifurcating into films that are going to really have a real TVOD window where people are going to go to the theater and really pay a marginal cost greater than zero to see that film and all the creative energy that Tim was alluding to that's really happening in the SVOD slash TV space where consumers are paying for it but not on a marginal cost greater than zero. So it's either inside a subscription model or it's ad supported. I think from our point of view, some of the trends that are happening is a lot more volume and excitement and interesting things happening in that SVOD pay space, whether it's at least in the States, like Amazon is actually starting to make really interesting original series. It's not just Netflix that has got that. I don't know if you guys here have heard about Transparent, but it's been a wild success for Amazon <clears throat> in the States. And something on the surface does not seem very commercial um, when you look at it, but it has just been hugely successful. And I think as we're looking at the world of digital distribution, it's not just iTunes anymore. It's myriad places and myriad revenue models. And the kind of content that's going to work on iTunes is not necessarily always the same content that's going to work under an SVOD model. And you can optimize your creative energies and think, where do I want people to see it? How do I want people to consume it? And think about that before you go ahead and make it, assuming that most of this audience is creator and filmmaker driven. And it, that's what we're starting to see. And Naveen, what are you seeing, given that you have slightly a different approach? Um, well, it's not even that much um, more of a different approach. Uh, it's just like the windowing and, unfortunately, the amount of money that it has to take to uh, release some of these films. Uh, but, uh, but also to add, um, there's, uh, you know, and it was great that you explained uh, the difference between transactional and essentially what's licensing for SFOD. Uh, what are these, uh, uh, you know, mediums replacing? Transactional, TVOD, like TVOD and EST replacing uh, DVD sales, which was you know, essentially gone. Uh, I mean, there's the tentpole pictures will still work in Walmart, but there's, there's no uh, blockbuster. There's n there's none of those uh, rent tailors anymore, uh, unless you go to uh, a red box, which also isn't a very good thing for uh, the business, frankly. Uh, uh, and their and, sales are down as well. And their sales are down too. Uh, so, and on the uh, and on SVOD, that is essentially re uh, uh, a shift from what was traditional pay TV. Um, so. So just because people are consuming more and more on SVOD, that's not necessarily a great thing for the overall business because the transactional revenue, whether it's DVD or, or TVOD, if that's dropping, uh, 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 SVOD is based on a flat licensing fee. So no, no matter how successful it ends up on Netflix, uh, those revenues uh, it, uh, don't necessarily come back on a per usage basis back to the filmmakers. It is a flat license fee based on whether it's a grid based on your box office or because it was direct TV or it has this one star, they're going to pay you X dollars, and that's it. Um, so so, so it's, I think it's important for us to consider that when we're talking going forward about uh, how, how the business has shifted. There's licensing, which is essentially flat uh, fee uh, and on the SVOD side, and there's AVOD stuff as well, but, uh, which is marginal revenue as well. And then there's the transactional, which is very important, but slipping. And uh, uh, so, um, sorry, I, and to go back to your overall point, what's the tipping point? I don't know. Every five years, we're projecting another tipping point. And it hasn't really tipped. It's just shifted. Uh, well, yeah, it, this, on the SVOD side, I think last year, there, I think it was like a dozen people that said they were going to be doing it. Sony, everybody was doing it. Um, I think even Samsung said they were going to do it. I don't know. Everyone was. How many have? It, it seems yeah. in the digital space the plans are big and they change a lot faster as well. Um, but, but given that there is this trend, how are the Canadian broadcasters, producers, and filmmakers uh, ad adapting to the, the SVOD world, the streaming, the changing viewing habits? Well, I guess maybe first, are they adjusting? 
Um, certainly the launch of Show Me and Crave seemed to be a response. Um, are they consumer centric enough? Are they still too closely tied to the old business model goals of holding on to people, the, the cord shavers, rather than reaching out entirely to cord cutters? Um, what should be really happening to address this here? Um, anybody want to jump in on that? Michael. Thank you. <laughs> you got to start with a microphone. Um, the if if you look at the at the business, you got to just remember most of this at at some point or other is is a business, and so a lot of these bright shiny things we're seeing in SVOD, um, they don't necessarily work long run, right? So if, if you look at the the broadcasters, they, we don't really have pure broadcasters anymore in Canada. We have um, affiliated companies of large vertically integrated companies that are making virtually all of their revenues um, on wireless and, and broadband and then cable um, and a little bit on, on TV. So their, their interests are not necessarily aligned with the broadcasting companies that they own. And the risk that they face if things go south is not very high. So a good example would be a company like Rogers, probably 80% of their, their share price is driven by how well they do in the wireless market. And most of the rest comes off the carriage side. So it, it's kind of irrelevant. Um, I think how's, uh, you know, are they doing enough? I think Crave TV looks very cool, but you know, I'm a Rogers subscriber. I can't get Crave TV. Rogers isn't gonna pick up Crave TV because it's half the price of Show Me and it gives you all the HBO stuff, so it would basically bury Show Me before Show Me even gets out of the gate. Um, so I'm a pissed off consumer, I'm not gonna switch because the technology doesn't work really well in my neighborhood and yet I'm a big TMN subscriber and uh, you know a, a Bell subscriber to all their services, um, all their broadcast services. Um, so you know I'm gonna be grumpy as, as well. Um, so I, I think SVOD is a huge risk. I, I think the biggest risk of SVOD, um, because I do think it's absolutely 100% the future, is that there's no real money in it um, for the majority of people that are making film and TV today um, to get commissions that will allow them to produce original content for that platform. And I think that we're going to see an erosion um, on the traditional platforms. I mean, broadcasting today um, is only, you know, makes up about 1% of uh, money going into original commissions, and that could become uh, even less. So it's, it's really ugly in, in, the, in the short run. It's great for consumers right now, but, you know, what you're seeing right now is not sustainable business, and ultimately very rich corporations are going to control, they're already really controlling what's going to happen. And, you know, today I pay 250, I'm a sort of high-end consumer, right? I pay about 250 for internet and cable and everything all in. Um, you can expect as a consumer to be paying anywhere from sort of 150 to $200 in the new world once, uh, you know, the people figure it out. Yeah, but it's just a lot of that may not flow towards original content. And if it's flowing to original content, uh, the majority may not flow to film. So that's tough. Dave, what did you have to weigh in on that? Um, well, maybe to take us back a little bit to the sort of the, one of the core issues is um, expectations among viewers and consumers have changed in as much as, you know, we hear the phrase often within the industry, anytime, anywhere. And that's the expectation that content is going to be made available to me. I'm not going to have to wait. I'm not going to have the orderly marketplace the way we uh, used to understand it. But just to, not to put too fine a point on it, but when we did the research recently um, that Mary was uh, referencing, uh, the number one place where people see films is still broadcast television. Okay, So before we uh, um, lament the demise of it completely, let's remember that that's still where most people are seeing films. What we're seeing, though, is tremendous growth in areas like subscription which another part of our research uh, asked the question, what's your preferred model? Is it transactional, in other words, pay as you go? Or is it the notion of something like Netflix where you pay a monthly subscription to have access to a library of, of, of content? 
Uh, by far, Canadians prefer the latter, uh, the idea there's a perception of value. And you can see the, our, the uh, <laughs> distributor on the panel is not so crazy about that model, and you can understand why. It's not transactional. You don't have that opportunity for an upside, so you're licensing, and, uh, and the person who's doing the licensing gets access to the content for a period of time. Uh, so, but one of the interesting phenomena for me that's emerged in, in, in this debate is um, one of the elements we haven't talked about, when we ask the question, where, do you, where are you seeing films? Are you seeing them in the home or in a movie theater? Um, I don't think we have a tipping point in terms of there's an erosion of attendance, but what we found with the most motivated moviegoers is as new uh, services and new platforms come online, they just see more movies. They see even more movies. And as more films are made available to them, there is a certain amount of cannibalization that happens because they're now spreading their time over uh, multiple platforms. But they're seeing uh, more movies, and uh, uh, so more platforms means more movies. And 6% of the time, uh, the 3,000 people who participated in our survey reported that they were seeing films neither in the home or in a movie theater, and so we're now we're talking mobile, and that's something that's emerged, and we haven't talked about it yet, but it's emerged in the last couple of years where there's a new phenomenon. There's a third way, there's a third place to see films, and that's mobile, um, and that's uh, I think that's something that we, we, we need to be thinking about too. Maybe just one last comment on this, because we're tending to lump everything in together when we talk about film and content. Um, I think there's, it's been referenced already, and I'll just sort of reinforce it, there's a, there's a world of independent cinema, which is largely what Canadian films sort of find themselves being a part of. And then there's studio films. And so it's, I think we need to reconcile that those business models as, as they emerge might not be exactly the same. They aren't the same now. So we have to sort of, in our mind's eye anyway, think differently about strategies, uh, however that gets delivered to audiences in whatever platform, that suit big budget studio productions and the, the kind of film that Naveen is talking about, and even the smaller films that uh, that find themselves um, on some of these smaller services. Well, let's uh, take that opportunity then to talk just about films, big films. Um, in the last year, the, the ones that made the most money overall, whether that was selling gingerbread kits or actually admission to go and see a film, Disney's Frozen, Guardians of the Galaxy, Thor the Dark World, Captain America, The Winter Soldier, and Maleficent, Lionsgate, The Hunger Games, Catching Fire, Warner Brothers, The Lego Movie, and Gravity, New Lines, The Hobbit, The Desolation of Smog, just like saying that, um, and also uh, Transformers, Age of Extinction, Lone Survivor, X-Men, Days of Future Past, and How to Train Your Dragon 2, Yay, sequels. Despite all of the exciting sequels, there was still another drop in movie attendance. And as uh, Christophe mentioned, we have high-end TV drama getting a lot of critical acclaim um, and, and buzz. So in light of all of this, um, let's just talk about the, the key piece in Canada, which is the film funding. And that sort of sets the stage for what gets made and, and at what level it can get made and how it can get promoted. So does, does something need to, to change in terms of the success index or um, it, it, what needs to change? And I'll start with you, Dave. Well, maybe we'll start with, uh, I won't take for granted that everybody knows what we're talking about. We mentioned the, when we talk about the success index. So maybe just a, a quick background on that. Um, up to a few years ago, the primary way, and it's completely natural that it would have been the case, the primary way where we, that we measured success for films was box office. How you did at the box office was a really good indicator for how your film would, would move to other platforms and, and do well. And it was interesting, I was reading an article this morning, uh, the head of CBS was um, describing uh, the process by which they put a lot of their content online and they now have sort of an over-the-top service for their content. And he, w he made the point of kind of lamenting that Nielsen ratings, which have been kind of the industry standard for, um, I guess, as long as anyone can remember, in his mind is, are not an adequate way to measure all the ways in which their TV shows are finding success with audiences. And it was a similar thinking that happened within the industry where box office, although it's a pretty good bellwether, is not the only way to think about success. And so what we introduced in collaboration with the industry was an index that takes into account um, qualitative as well as quantitative, how your film traveled internationally, keeping in mind that Canada is maybe 
three, four percent of the world market. We were only measuring box office in Canada. We now take into account international sales. We take into account critical success through prizes, festival selections, and so on. And so the, the notion of the success index was to get a more comprehensive take on how films find success because they can find them in any number of ways, including at the box office. And so the answer to the question, will the success index need to evolve as we go along, I think it's only normal that as new platforms come on stream that we'll be thinking about how those factor in in terms of uh, measuring how films have been successful internationally. And maybe just one, one other point. One of the, th the things we're thinking about right now is if success index is talking about the individual performance of a film, um, what about measuring access? Uh, for us, it's important as an agency that the films that we support and the Canadian titles are present on the shelf. Uh, we, you can't be expected to view them if they're not there for you to see. So one of the things we're looking to start measuring is the extent to which on all of these platforms that we're talking about, is that Canadian title, uh, some of them we mentioned earlier, is it even there for you to see? Is it on iTunes? Is it on Netflix? Is it on other services? And what are the impediments, if any, uh, to their being there? But the idea is that you need to be on the shelf for someone to want to uh, you know, to, to want to make the choice to actually see it. Since the expectations have to change and the rising digital dollars aren't making up physical sh short form uh, of the overall pie, um, but the margins are better in a lot of the digital areas like the, the streaming versus physical media sales, um, I wanted to talk now about what filmmakers need to keep in mind when they're putting together the financing for a film. Um, how, how does the role of digital distribution uh, make a change in their monetization plans and their strategy? Um, Janet, do you want to take a stab at that? Um, well, I think uh, if, you're, if you're planning a, a project, um, I think the most important thing is being realistic. I mean... A lot of the times we will we will be looking at projects and we'll be asked for estimates like, here's my film, how much do you think I'm going to make? And filmmakers will compare against like different sales agents or different distributors saying, how much do you think I'm going to make? Um, there's zero accountability on behalf of the sales agent or distributor to deliver a number that they think they actually will do. Um, however, we consider that we have a lot of accountability, so we try to give very realistic numbers. And that conversation usually works when the filmmaker has made a film that 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 is got the right budget for the screens it's eventually going to be seen on. So what, what I think the biggest area of disconnect is when filmmakers are making things that are, say, $2 million, $3 million, $4 million budgets and are thinking that they are going to be going with a traditional theatrical release. If the film really does merit a traditional theatrical release, great. That budget's realistic and, and low, arguably, if you look at studio standards. But I think the biggest problem is when you think you've made something that's going to have a traditional release and you've spent that budget and that is not a realistic distribution um, distribution strategy for your film is when you run into trouble. Because over the past five years, where you could have seen maybe DVD would have made up for it or maybe other things would make up for it, digital is very real, but the average numbers are smaller, particularly if the film did not have a traditional theatrical. So my, my uh, advice would just be be incredibly realistic about your story and how big its scale and scope is when you're coming up with the budget. Because digital can be awesome if you've made the film for half a million, a million, 1.5 at an independent level. Digital can be terrible if you're trying to recoup $5 million budgets and you have not made a film that's going to have a significant P&A and have a proper theatrical. Um, so that would... You're talking about that in like a North American context. Yeah, too. yeah, Like yeah. that's just like, that doesn't... Or one tenth of the population. Here. Yeah, it I didn't work even here. get it beyond that. Right, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Are there just too many films? Uh, I was reading recently that uh, about a dead mall syndrome in the U.S. and how the vacancy rate is spiraling, and that it's not uh, it, it it's not just e-com. That's only ten percent of the whole retail pie. It's just that there's too many retail outlets, um, given the easy access and and you think a somewhat lower cost a barrier uh, for, for some young filmmakers to 
get their film out there to be able to promote it through social media um we've it, it's almost like the desktop publishing publishing revolution all over again especially because of the marketing piece is there too many absolutely 100 percent. okay so now we've solved that um <laughs> Well, they, they, you just pointed it out. The cost of production is plummeted, right? So it costs basically nothing to make it. However, there's still only 24 hours in the day. So that's the basic problem. Um, and that we haven't gotten into it, but I think one of the things is that you were saying before, Mary, like focus on films. But one of the other things to think about when you have the creative idea and are trying to budget it, is it really a film or is it episodic or is it webisodic? Even though I hate that word, but if someone has a better word for that concept throw it out but um like does it really have to be a feature film in that massive budget that it entails or could you make you know a six by six or six by ten episodic series put it on youtube and make the whole thing for 100k and recoup it from ad sales yes you could and people are doing it right now so it's like being realistic about the true life of your ideas so yeah, just maybe a couple of numbers on your question sure so um you know ted hope who i think uh, he's going to be here in about a couple of weeks i think or maybe even less Next week. Uh, and he's a great guy, really worth coming here and listening to him. But uh, I was listening to him down at AFM, um, and he was saying, you know, it's anywhere between thirty and 50,000 films are made a year. I mean, it's an absurd number. So at the low end, right, I mean, at the, at, at, at the low end, you, you'd be getting lost in the noise. We're very lucky here in Canada, and thanks to, to things like, like uh, telefilm and, you know, tax credit systems. That, that keep, you know, seem to do a good job of mixing commercial and art projects together. But even that, to, to get to your point about time, right, no time, there's a, we've seen a 10% increase in, in television viewing, right, and that's the, the main platform, as Dave says, for TV. But there's been a 275% increase over the same period of time. This is, you know, North America, UK. 275% increase in scripted drama. So even the best stuff, I mean, we all, we all know, right? It's, it's, it's a common thing everybody's saying now. I'd love to watch that series, and I can't. And we're talking about stuff that, you know, the best kind of stuff on TV that you just didn't have 10 years ago. That's the kind of competition everybody's facing. And not to mention all the, the movies and series that brands are creating, like The Beauty Inside or Kokanee the Movie Here. Um, does smaller equal better in the digital space? Or maybe another way to look at this, um, back to the retailer example, is niche the new mass? Um, is it a better bet to have a really tightly targeted audience who are going to you know, help you get the film out there and help you get an audience? Anybody? Well, I could, I could certainly speak to a couple of the things that have come up. Uh, I understand there's a, there's a problem with oversupply. I don't see how that's a problem on, uh, for a creator. I, I really don't see how the problem of too many films is actually a problem creatively. I think it's fantastic that so many people are now competing to make competitive work that will vie to find audiences around the world and that so much diversity exists for audiences and there will be a natural process every, every year where, where people pick stuff. And what we're finding, of course, to our delight as filmmakers is that this process is mediated less and less by gatekeepers more and more, more discoverability is an issue, but stuff gets discovered. So one of the great things about digital dis distribution, even in an environment controlled by two or three aggregators, I see that as a bit of an issue. But right now, what we see as an opportunity is that um, digital distribution is probably a very nimble way to match niche films with niche audiences. And therefore, it does hold out huge opportunities for filmmakers particularly in a generation where we're less in love with theatrical releases, less completely dependent on it existentially in order to feel good about ourselves. And so there are so many ways from, from vining all the way through to tentpole filmmaking for um, filmmakers to find audiences. I think, I think we have a better situation than we've ever had. Um, we are looking at a situation on the smaller question where many, many micro-budget films get made. And again, we see a huge opportunity for people to get an idea to audiences. And sometimes these works are competitive enough to get large audiences. On balance, though, we find that a well-funded film will perform better. And this is, this is anecdotal, but I think most people agree with this, that on average, your odds of finding a large audience are better with a decently funded film 
than on a film that has no money attached. And so one of our biggest preoccupations as filmmakers and at the Directors Guild of Canada is A, will I be able to find this audience through this new pipe? And in some ways, I'd say over 10 or 15 years of listening to all the talk about pipe laying in Canada, it's a blur at this point. But is this pipe going to get us an audience? And B, is there enough money? Is there enough equity investment for our films um, or percentage of our films so that they can be competitive in what is clearly now a fully international viewing market? And uh, it's a crucial question for first time, second time, third time filmmakers. And the corollary to that is, will I get to make my second, third, and fourth film? In other words, will I become a known, a known filmmaker in this community, this very supple community of viewers? Because in Canada, our star system, when we, when we really had a successful film, uh, you know, film community in Canada, our star system was the filmmakers. Uh, it was the cheapest way. Uh, it was a lot cheaper than having a star system of actors, although we believe in that too. How does a filmmaker develop... Um, a repeat exposure to audiences which will allow that filmmaker to develop a name. And again, we see the digital universe as a relatively nimble way to do that, assuming you can get through the noise. So On that note, um, Piers Handling, in his New Year's roundup for playback, had said, Canadian filmmakers need to continue to take more risks, be adventuresome and daring. When they do, sparks are ignited and the world takes notice. And Kevin Spacey speaking at Ad Week, talking about his little series that you might have seen on Netflix, said that the, the brilliance of that was being one of the first original series. Netflix didn't give notes. Maybe they didn't know they were supposed to give notes, but they didn't. Um, and that's why it worked. Like, they were able to be completely outrageous. You know, but kill you a know, dog, like, sure, why not? I, I really hate that when people say, well, you know, if, you were, if you're more creative, if you took more risks, if you're more original. I mean, you know, House of Cards was, uh, it's, it's a British series. It's a really good British series, too. I watched one episode of Kevin Spacey and said, not as good. Um, but, you know, watch the next one. I think the... Back so, by Sony. And also, uh, yeah, backed by Sony and what else? Uh, uh, credit, so yeah. So credit where credit is due. You know, David said there's sort of like there's big tentpole stuff, which I think we'd all agree. You know, you can't make in Canada except as a foreign location kind of thing. We make a lot of them for other people, uh, but you know, not to say a Canadian director couldn't make the film, but it's not a Canadian film. Um, so it's independent, but when when they talk about independent films in the U.S., right, you're talking thirty to sixty million dollar films. I think we are probably one of the best positioned countries in the world to hit that niche spot because we have an incredibly good um, public support system. We're seeing, particularly on the English side, you know, almost a 50 50 sort of public private investment. So we're seeing increased private investment. And we're making movies already that, you know, a million to five million dollar movies that look a whole bunch better. Um, like, I, like the, you know, that example of Big Muddy. Um, we're probably, you know, the level of the talent and crews because of the private public partnership we've had in this country for the last 30 years we're poised to be successful in a low budget environment low budget as measured by the rest of the world um, as opposed to Canadian where we say hey that looks pretty good so I think there is the opportunity for success you know one of the things we're doing with producers association um, and Marguerite Pickett who was the uh, you know uh, doing the la hosting the last session um, we've had a project uh, with Wendy Bernfeld out of Amsterdam. We've we have identified 120 um, digital platforms, um, you know, Netflixy type services around the world by you know language, genre, and everything. What they charge, who the sales agent, how they buy, you know, they buy by show. To usually, they, they buy by package, et cetera, et cetera, um, as as an opportunity. So you know, those kind of things we we can leverage them. But I think you know, Tim and I were talking earlier. Um, you can only be successful if the, one of the reasons we are successful is because um, you know the public policy has has valued film and television and things like telefilm and the CMF and the tax credits and the independent funds and CRTC benefits. All of those things have allowed the industry to mature. Where I think we've moved from you know where we used to talk about telling our stories to each other to actually being able to tell and sell our stories to the world. And we, we should be proud of that. I think we're, we're in a good position. 
And, and I've got to be examples of that. And, and I don't mean this to be a plug for the company I'm working at, but you know, we've got a Canadian television show creator, uh, Michael McGowan, who we're in concert with uh, Don Carmody, which is the lead producer on it. Uh, that is a Netflix original series that is in partnership with Rogers here in Canada. And it's because of this. And he's never made a Hollywood film. He's made Canadian film all his life. Uh, Patricia Rosema, uh, we're doing a film with her, uh, Into the Forest. A24 has picked it up in the U.S. Like, we can do it when we should continue to focus on that. So um, in addition to maybe also, daring is a quality of, of, of a good <laughs> film as well, and I was more or less pointing out that uh, it can sometimes help in the promotion of a film, like the interview, um, but let's just go generally on that topic about how to prep differently for a digital or a hybrid release in terms of the marketing. How do the marketing opportunities differ. There's a whole different math equation um, of return on investment and also maybe what the triggers are. Um, Janet, because you sort of specialize in this area, do you want to talk about uh, what, what's working, how, do you, how you can break through? Well, I mean, in the best case, marketing starts with funding. Um, and a lot of films we're working on have done some kind of crowdfunding in the beginning. Crowdfunding is obviously the very first part of the marketing process. You get a group of people who you can keep posted on every single step of the way. Um, so starting early starts with financing. Um, and then, uh, so that's, I guess it's a bunch of obvious points. That's one obvious point. Um, and have a bunch of dedicated people that have put money in who are going to want to spread the word for you. Incentivize them to spread the word by giving them all the sorts of creative awards and stuff that people do such a good job of on sites like Kickstarter or Indiegogo. Um, and one of the things that we see by the time we're getting involved um, is that extras are hugely, hugely important and all the extra bits and bobs and assets both to use when we're marketing to platforms but also when we're using all the various social channels um, just to give you a sense of what we do on our films, we just end up with asset libraries. So we'll go through with the filmmaker and come up with all the clips and every single possible thing that does exist or that they think they could make. And then we go through with PR and allocate what's going to happen. Like, is this going to be exclusive here? Is this going to go for a cable barker? Is this going to go for a PR exclusive? So making sure as you make the content that you have an eye on building a, a, an asset library for social marketing or just to have on hand is hugely, hugely important. Because if we end up with a film and the filmmaker's like, I, I maybe have a trailer and th that's it, they have like nothing else, it's really tricky. Not that it's impossible, it's tricky. Um, so number one in financing, use the crowd. Number two, while you're shooting, take lots of outtakes. And three, when you get to distribution, work closely with your distributor. Um, I was saying this to some folks this morning and, and just before this panel, like if marketing starts with being heavily involved, like just because you made the film, um, I'm assuming now like everybody understands it's not a process of handing it over to whoever the distributor is. And we as a distributor do our best work when the filmmaker stays super heavily involved. Um, and we tell them every single step of the way what we're doing, here's the budget, this is what's happening. And we really pool resources and work as a team. And I think that's the best way to stay involved with your marketing. Don't just trust someone else with it. Even if they paid you, if they paid you gobs of money, okay. But if they didn't pay you gobs of money, stay involved and figure out a way because no one knows the material better than you. And as a filmmaker, you are the strongest marketing asset or one of the strongest marketing assets. Um, and one of the things that filmmakers help us with the most is a channel to talent. Um, the talent that you had appear in the film, you want to make sure that you have not pissed them off by the end of the production and that they will be reachable and accessible for all interviews, extras, and everything else. Um, I could go on, but I'll stop. <laughs> Naveen, do you find that given reaching a digital audience that may be anywhere and are, might just be linked psychographically, it's, it's harder to maybe reach them through the old methods. Do you have to think about marketing earlier? Does it play more of a role even in the development of the film in terms of you can't, if you can't find a great headline and story and way to, to reach that audience that, that isn't the traditional audience? What kind of impact does that have? Um, well, on the digital front, uh it's uh it's always been for us uh you know we always work as hard as we can to try to get the best uh, shelf space 
And I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and that's not necessarily an easy thing to do. But whether it's curated in, in, in some folder that you know that your audience will go to, that's really what's most important. And that you have, a, as you're mentioning, an, uh, materials, a trailer that gets them hooked. You know, it's, it's, I don't want to oversimplify it, but uh, you need a great static image and you need a great trailer. And a title and, that starts with A. <laughs> a title that starts with A. Uh, first of all, those archaic uh, uh, user interfaces. Uh, and I, I actually, I want to touch upon it. I think there's a real problem in Canada uh, as compared to the U.S. Uh, our, uh, the services here just haven't been focusing. And you need the partnership of these services. I got to tell you, uh, my services like iTunes here in Canada, they have an office here, and they're very passionate people, and they really want to uh, support the underdog films. They really do, and so does the uh, guys at Rogers. So does guys at uh, Telus and everybody else. But one of the problems is is that their UI on certain services on cable platforms are very limited. They're very limited. So so if the expectation is that you'll be able to find your audience uh, on on these uh, outdated user interfaces, uh, it's not going to happen. So you have to go to these uh, digital ones and work very closely with them and make sure that they're helping you support because they are the conduit. They are the, you know, at the front line with your audience. So you've got to make sure that they're working it for you. Is there any way that these uh, digital platforms are impacting the need for the sales agents, the distributors, and even uh, the festival strategy for films? Like, how, how is that changing the way you way you go to market and how you spend that money and time. Um, it really hasn't changed for us uh, all that much. Again, we're a new company, but from having worked at other uh, film distribution companies, I don't see that there's a or that much of a change because you want to try to get as much awareness of your product as possible. And that's of course on the films that you know I've historically released. And mind you, we've worked on smaller films. That, uh, there's um, uh, UVOD releases, Opportunities, which are basically released in, th in theaters and on VOD at the same time. I would love to see UVOD uh, uh, grow in Canada as it has in the U.S., but mind you, it's, it's, it's still hit or miss, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's really hit or miss. Uh, uh, for every uh, one success that I've seen, there's probably been like nine or ten that didn't work. Uh, so it's changed the... Uh, th it's provided opportunities for us as distributors to try to find new ways of trying to get uh, films to market. Uh, I'm not sure if we're there yet. Uh, Dave, you had uh, a point? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, in, you know, we've, we've covered a, a lot of themes that kind of, for me, connect together. The notion of, uh, you know, keeping your project within a certain scope, uh, knowing the scope of project and, and your audience, targeting and building a community early on, uh, starting as, as, as early as you can. These, these are being daring um, in your subject matter, sort of you know going outside the box. There are all ways in which you can help to build your audience early and help to distinguish yourself. And I think that when it comes to sort of general question of, you know, what is the reasonable expectation for the filmmaker to achieve all of that uh, along with their team, and also have all the business savvy of knowing how to position your film through festivals and a theatrical release, whether a theatrical is right, which distributor is the best equipped, and that's even, you know, within our border. What's your what's your strategy internationally? Uh, there's so many bits and pieces here, and I think that examples like the CMPA's uh, initiative to bring Wendy in, who's an expert on the European market and all the opportunities that uh, producers have for getting their films on platforms, there are a good example of that kind of thing. Another one um, that I would uh, um, highlight is uh, there was an announcement recently by the Doc Association uh, for an initiative that Telefilm's been a part of in terms of, uh, of a supporter called Festival Concierge. And it's exactly that. It's, it's, it's allowing uh, filmmakers to be accompanied by experts who can help them with the job. They're not necessarily going to be doing their sales for them. They're, that's another role, and that's one I would also recommend you, 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 uh, you hook up with. Uh, but the idea of the Festival Concierge was Doc came to us and said, navigating all of the positioning around where to place uh, your documentary, where to put out in the world first, where to follow up, and how to get the, the, the whole idea here is how do you get the most out of the audience for your film 
out of the revenue potential for your film, out of the notoriety for your talent and your team. And so I think that more and more we're seeing that there are opportunities for that expertise that is within our industry here in Canada to be hooking up with, uh, with people at a very early stage to accompany them and help them to make the most of the idea here is to, you know, there's, there's a limit to the potential of every film, but we want to see it uh, reach its full potential. And, and I think that more and more we're going to be seeing those types of relationships build up. It sort of leads into the last area that we wanted to discuss, and that is in the digital universe, is there such a thing as borders anymore? Um, what Naveen was alluding to, but not for publication. Um, a big reason Canadian TV got on screens was CanCon regulations. Sorry, filmmakers, you don't have that. Um, and then there was a push for a similar commitment from services let, such as Netflix to fund content the way the Canadian broadcasters do if they're going to operate here. Um, but in the digital world of uh, media co's, that's likely not realistic. I'm not sure if anyone's still lobbying for that. Um, so if regulation isn't part of the digital media scape, what does that mean for the Canadian ecosystem, which has largely been greatly helped <laughs> by, by having some cultural um, protection and, and boosting and, and guardianship? And uh, what kind of a framework could be put in place to support it? If not Starlight, what are some of the answers? Tim, you had your hand up. Sure. Um, well, we're, we're not at all convinced that um, the borders uh, will disappear. Uh, for one, we believe that most businesses like borders. Uh, we, we believe that most businesses like orderly economies to function in. Um, not all businesses in film like borders, but many do. For instance, any business selling a production likes borders. Any, any business buying a production tends to not like borders. There's a balance where everybody likes an orderly marketplace, and we feel that there's a potential um, for borders to remain for purely business reasons in some form yet to be discovered. Do we think it's a good thing culturally? It's our absolute lifeblood. There'd be no Directors Guild of Canada. In fact, there'd be no TIFF. There'd be very few of the jobs that we actually see in the business right now without those borders. There's absolutely no reason for Canada to exist without its border, and, and in cultural terms, in the entertainment business, Netflix has proved, by virtue of the fact that it doesn't even have a head office here, that there's no reason to have anything Canadian without some notion of sovereignty. So for us to say there will be a borderless society for film is an absolute non-starter. It's intellectually completely, uh, it's, a, it's, it's, it's a practical problem. It's also intellectually completely unsatisfactory. So we believe that borders will exist, partially because there's a cultural will to express ourselves as Canadian filmmakers. And the big challenge, of course, for us is not so much to have quotas. Quotas may go away. The big challenge for all of us is to have enough money to make films. We just need money to make films. If you really asked us, and they do all the time, what do you need? We just say money. We're a small economy with a limited audience, and yet there's a fixed cost to making films that are competitive, that look good, that people want to watch. And that, that goes for all kinds, every kind of film. So what we need is money. So do we believe that the industry, uh, if it purrs along, in a, even in its current form, as a purely private sector activity, would provide enough money to make competitive films in Canada? We, we say no. We've proved that's the case. We know that's the case. We know that uh, we'd immediately be reaching for a minority co-production opportunities where no Canadian filmmakers would be involved, or appreciably none. A lot of crew would, and that's good for our guild. So we think there should be outside money, and the outside money comes from the public sector. And we believe that there's a very strong ongoing argument for having outside public sector money in a small film economy like Canada, France, Germany, virtually everywhere except China, India, and the United States of America, there is an argument for having public support for uh, the film arts uh, virtually everywhere. And how it's expressed, of course, will change over time, but it does mean that Telefilm Canada matters. It means that the Canadian Media Fund matters. It means that a robust tax system matters. And it means that robust uh, provincial equity investment in film matters. Look only to the success of Quebec filmmakers, not only at home, but basically all around the world. Quebec filmmakers are currently eating Canada's Canadian you know, English Canada's lunch in terms of their success. Um, and there are geniuses, but we have a few here. Uh, so we believe that provincial equity investment is also something worth arguing for as we go forward. And we won't, we really don't succumb, won't succumb to the fashion of saying that a borderless society means we can drop tools and just see what happens. 
We don't have a lot of time before we're going to the question um, part of the panel, but I did want to ask if anyone else had any thoughts on that. Uh, so I, I, and I tend to agree a lot with, with Tim on this point. Um, the presumption that because the market is more global, um, that suddenly regulation will disappear or it can't exist, it's, it's no longer relevant, uh, I think is, is totally wrong. I have absolute belief in, you know, it scares the hell out of me, that disruption is going to continue to uh, uh, be significant and it will cause uh, major shifts um, and put a lot of businesses under. Uh, it will lead to, you know, reconstruction within the market. Some of it may be good. Uh, you know, sometimes disruption, painful as it is, can lead to um, uh, to to better things. Um, it's, it's it's for whatever reason, it's going to be crazy. But <coughs> I don't see any country in the world um, giving up levels of regulation. I even see the the U.S. is uh, you know about to introduce a much more public utility common common carrier regulation uh, on the internet. Um, people um, still. Um, uh, have copyright rules even if they don't work um, as much as maybe some people would like. And even countries like China, I mean, you know, look at film. Um, the Americans would love to, you know, pump more movies into China, uh, but there, there's a quota. There's 34, you know, uh, movies a year that are allowed in. So, you know, if Guardians of the Galaxy comes out as number 35, too bad, you're not, you're not getting in. So, Everybody regulates in their own ways. Markets regulate themselves. Uh, as Tim says, borders are critically uh, important for um, rights management. And even you're seeing Netflix is starting to kind of do the math. I think the, the noise that they're making about they don't really like virtual private networks. I mean, you know, probably we think about a third of the Netflix business right now, Canadian uh, or, you know, business they're doing with Canadian subscribers is actually people going through virtual private networks to get the U.S. service. Uh, that's wrong. Uh, techie people say, well, you know, it's not clear it's illegal. It is. Um, and, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can say that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's Netflix wants to make sure, just like all the other big players, that when they're licensing rights, to particular territories that they're maximizing the revenues. And so if the big players that ultimately still control the game um, don't pay enough attention to the game of rights, and they do, um, then it, it falls apart. But if they do pay attention, then you do have systems that you can still regulate. You do have the opportunity uh, for contributions. You know, they're going to be eroded. That's going to be very different. There, there's going to be, you know, there will be fallout. But the the world, you, you can have massive changes in terms of choice and without, you know, giving up some degree of sovereignty uh, within your own borders. And that applies to every country. Our very last question for the panel, before I turn it to the audience, I just wanted to look at the flip side of that in the opportunity and the importance of the global audience that the digital platforms open up for Canada. And beyond that, any other ways people can be looking at monetizing their content because of the, the global and digital and the data element of this type of distribution, the fact that you know more about who is consuming the content. It's huge. It's, it's absolutely huge. And here's an interesting thing like with Netflix, right? They measure 30 million plays uh, globally a day. They know exactly what type of movie resonates with audience, what doesn't. Like throw out Nielsen, throw out all that kind of stuff. These guys like Netflix, Amazon, there's, they are so technically sav technologically savvy. They have the best information about what works and what doesn't. And, you know, think about House of Cards, right? So what did they follow up House of Cards with based on all this information? A four-movie four deal with Adam Sandler. You know, what, is that, what does that tell you? I don't know. Uh, but it, it's that... <laughs> That is, uh, you know, I don't even want to think about it. Um, but that is, that is, you know, 
that's a massive opportunity for us because it may mean that exactly what people were talking about, that they can measure what of those niche products that we're so good at making uh, work and what doesn't. And they will start to feed that back to, uh, to the producers of, of that content, even if they don't share it with the marketplace. Naveen? And I think what you just ended on, uh, that they don't share it with the marketplace, that's a problem for us because and for filmmakers, because we don't know if we're getting hosed or not, really. Well, as producers, we've never known. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's your turn as the talent, Tim, to sort of jump in and say something about producers. <laughs> we don't care. We just want to make it, man. I swear, if someone said, here, you got a million dollars, you can make, make a feature, but you can't keep any of the money for yourself, or you've got a million dollars and you make two episodes for somebody else's show, and you can keep 150000 of it, I, I have to say a majority of our members would say, I'll make the feature and take no money myself. So part of why we exist as a union is to prevent most of our members from working for absolutely free to see their dreams come true. You're not uh, letting the market do its job. No, man. <laughs> I know you'd love that. Uh, but really, honestly, uh, again, it comes down to the aspiration to make film, and it's not going away. It's gotten more, and we want to do it better. And uh, it's going to continue. It'll continue no matter what's happening with the pipe. You know, they can plug it into my TV or your TV. It's going to, people are going to keep wanting to put their, their stories in. And we believe the best chance is for the creative teams to be given a chance to propose uh, audacious uh, work. And uh, we believe that the, the new nimble digital universe will find uh, an appreciative audience for that audacious work. And that uh, too much reverse engineering to content, like you gotta make a market friendly film, it's all true. But I feel that if, I, I feel that if the creative teams get to make their work, we're now in a better position than ever with the new technology to find an audience for that work. Well, I think everybody on the panel should just come together, create our own streaming service, and sell all the data to, to brands. As long as Bruno Co. finances it. Okay. Um, and now, questions from the audience. And we have one. In the second row. Hello. Uh, I think it's the fifth time I ask this question in the 10 years I've been in Canada. Um, I'm from France, and I just checked the numbers. France is actually the only country in the world right now where the uh, frequentation of the theaters hasn't gone down. It's gone up 35% in 15 years, where every single other country has gone down. The fact is, 15 years ago, France changed their system drastically for moviegoers, making the price of tickets almost nothing. Now, in Canada and in the US in the past 15 years, the price of movie tickets in theaters has become proactively expensive for everyone. The most of the people I know would like to see films in the theaters because it's most, more spectacular, it's more interesting, it's more everything. But all of them tell me, dude, 17 bucks for a film, plus popcorn, plus Coke, it's like 30 bucks a person, a night. That's ridiculous. So what is your take on this? That's a very good point. It's kind of like yeah, gas mean, if, prices, if, like quantity. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd probably go to a couple more movies if it was only five bucks. But, you know, I can watch any movie on TV for five bucks right now. Tim could have watched Boyhood if he'd waited one more week. <laughs> uh, it's it's five ninety nine. You spent $19. But, yeah, so, but, I mean, I think my take on it is I can't see the government of Canada... Um, regulating the price of uh, movie tickets. Did all the other theaters go to business? Well, our 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 exhibition thing, we are, all the other guys are already out of business. So it would be very stupid, you know, if you got a monopoly with a high rent to lower it just for kindness. How did they? It'd be great. It'd be great. I get you. That. Did they bring in sponsors and? after a year and it, it's a year minimum the subscription so you have to pay for 12 months and after a year they had the first data come in and they proved that most of the people who subscribed actually were just going to watch one movie a month so they're still making money because people are paying for two and a half three movies but most of them in the end they, for the first three months everyone was going to watch two or three movies and then after that 
went down back to one movie a month. Except 20? film buffs like me. 29 a month? 20, it's, it was nine, 18 euros at okay. the time. So 29, 30 bucks a month. And they said they did that because they were making most of their money on the concessions. And they realized that if they had less people come in, well, they had less concessions. So if they could get the people in for almost nothing, and you know, after you've watched two movies, you think, oh, the third one is free, and the fourth and the fifth and the sixth and everything. Then what are you going to do? You're going to buy more popcorn. That's exactly what happened. We're going to switch to being the popcorn makers uh, union. <laughs> yeah. It's clearly the better plan. You, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit of back to the future. Uh, I remember when I was uh, going to McGill, uh, there used to be repertory theaters where you would pay uh, for your annual um, membership, and uh, uh, and then you get to see movies at a discount. And, and there's also, by the way, and later on when I was working at 20th Century Fox, we would have a lot of arguments over that money because, you know, is the, the subscription money really buying the ticket to the film that we sold to the movie theater and so on. So uh, it's interesting how things kind of go in cycles. I, I was reading recently that there are a couple of pilot projects in the U.S. where uh, I think it's AMC who's looking to do a kind of a monthly subscription. I don't know if it's uh, is as flat out as you describe, but I think, you know, obviously uh, it, when we did the research and asked questions, what are the, some of the impediments that Canadians see to going to movies more often? Uh, one was, you know, the perception that the, the that the cost is high. And that's not just about the ticket, but it's about everything that goes with going, you know, from the parking to the babysitter and so on. So that it, it is, there's an impression among Canadians that it's an expensive proposition and that as content becomes more available on other platforms, I'm not sure if this is a race to the bottom or not, but I think at some point we have an ecosystem where there needs to be revenue generated on the back of, uh, you know, if, if everything's free to see, whether it's in a cinema, I mean, that has to flow back to the filmmakers, has to flow back to the production of other films. So we have to keep it balanced I there. Think, I think you hit on a, a good point. Is something that, that Ted Hope said, uh, um, he sort of probably said a lot of times, um, is that when he was growing up and when he entered the you know, uh, movie business, um, people used to go to the movies. You know, you'd, you'd say to your friends or your date or whatever, like, let's go to the movies on the weekend. He said nobody thinks that way anyways you you you'll you'll say you know what's playing at the theaters and is there a specific movie i want to go see um and even the windows for that kind of stuff boyhood's a good example you know to move from the theater to one week um on transactional and then go into rental um it's you know there's a lot of good reasons to stay at home for that you know the 60 inch screen and, you know, not go to the movies. But I have my scene card and my free <laughs> movie passes from Shoppers Drug Mart. Well, you know well I, mean? I, I think one of the other things to uh, take in consideration specific to Canada is Canada is highly under-screened compared to the U.S. So, so you know, can, uh, the U.S., you go there uh, and you're going to 24 plexes. And in small towns, you're going to 12 plexes. Here, you're going to the big theaters are 12 plexes and six plexes. So, you're, so the, it's, it's, it's quite difficult for us. Uh, going back to Canadian films, uh, to you know, w w as much as we want to uh, get them in theaters, it's hard to get them in theaters unless you've picked that right date where there might be an urban uh, or faith-based films which just don't really work here. If you try to figure your date, then then you can try to get in the theaters. Uh, so that's a, a, a significant problem here, and also uh, uh, to the overall point about box office being down. And I, I remember in an email t earlier on today, which I said to the, uh, the crew here, that I actually don't believe that this is a trend. I don't think box office is going down. I think it was a bad year. You had a lot of films that moved out of the year. Minions, uh, Fast 7, uh, the, uh, the Pixar film. It just, it, it's, and then the interview at the end of the year, it just it fucked things up. Like, and uh, uh, Exhibition was not planning that it was going to be a drop. These movies fell out. And you're going to see probably a drop on VOD this coming year because of this effect in the theatrical window just now. I, I think next year is probably going to be a lot stronger. So you think Star Trek's and the uh, and the Avengers or Star Star Wars and the Avengers are going to kick it up again? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and 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 that's the unfortunate thing. We're talking about 20 films. We're not talking about the films that I'm distributing and the ones that you guys are making or, or the ones you're distributing. It, it's the, we're not part of that number. We're we have another question at the back here. Hi there. Um, 
I, one of the things I really like about uh, Film Buff uh, as a filmmaker is that the uh, the dashboard, which shows us basically Thank in real so time. Much. Thank you. <laughs> it shows you in real time, basically with about a week delay, what you're actually making. So all your iTunes, all your Hulu Plus, it's great. And I'm I'm just curious because I've noticed that there's a, a, a significant lack of data um, with regards to, to digital sales. I know for streaming services, they want to hide that data. But for individual filmmakers and also things like iTunes, trans transactional VOD, I'm wondering if you guys see any initiatives to, for filmmakers to be better educated about those numbers so they know where to budget their films and also, um, you know, just any sort of more structured or more, uh, you know, share-worthy kind of uh, initiatives in order to share that information. Well, um, thanks so much for the shout out. The dashboard, it's such hard work, and we're really proud of it. Um, and uh, just if I may, for others in the room, so we, um, as Naveen said, some data is just not available. Like Netflix doesn't tell us. They'll say, you know, we're licensing your film for 50K, 100K, 250K, but you don't know as a distributor, and therefore we can't tell you as filmmakers how many times someone watched the film. Um, and Nielsen says they're going to measure it, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, but what we are able to show on the dashboard is the data we do get, which is how many, how many buys did you have on iTunes, when, where, how many people saw it on Hulu. All the data we get, we pass through. Um, but I think your question is a different point, which is, um, something that uh, John Sloss at Cinetic and I at Film Buff um, and Tom Quinn at Radius, a, a bunch of us have been trying to drive more visibility in terms of what the VOD numbers actually are. Um, the box office is obviously clearly reported everywhere that you can go. Um, and John coined the term uh, the end of 2013 that we were calling multi-screen gross. And it's particularly um, meant to be targeting day and date releases. So that if you're releasing something day and date, you're not just looking at how much it made at the box office, but how much it also made in a reasonable window of, of time, which we thought would be six weeks in VOD. So we did do that and we're measuring it um, and trying to get people to like pool data, it was very difficult to do. Um, people just don't want to share that data. So we were unilaterally sharing some of ours. Radius um, has done a good job sharing some of theirs. Um, there's a company called RentTrack um, that you may have heard of that is basically the measuring system in the VOD space. So they show to all of us as distributors how much our movies have made specifically on the cable platforms. Um, but again, this isn't public. So your question is well phrased. Yes, everyone's talking about it and there's lots of initiatives, but it's there. it hasn't been pooled together. So as distributors, we aren't having to report our VOD grosses in a way that everybody does as a box office gross. I think it's just a matter of time. For all the reasons that we've spent the past hour talking about, this is where so many films are actually making revenue and it's just a matter of time until we see VOD gross and box office gross treated the same way. I think we have room for one more question. And by room, I mean time. Right there. Hi. Uh, thanks so much. This was super informative. I actually just wanted to bring it back to the conversation around borders because I noticed the two distributors sat very calmly and quietly, while the DGC and the CMPA and, and Telefilm didn't really weigh in on that question, because to reference Netflix is exactly the situation. I'm an independent producer, like many people in this room. And as distributors of content in Canada and the rest of the world, how are you guys feeling about borders? And do you think that actually keeping them up is going to save, or for whatever better term there is, the Canadian filmmaking landscape? Do you think that we would no longer make movies in Canada if we didn't have these things in place? Thank you. Um, in the case of uh, my company, uh, we need borders because we can't operate on a global basis. We're just too small. Um, and if you even take a look in the US, uh, the Weinstein Company, uh, A24, uh, Open Road, they're handling themselves in the U.S. Uh, it's only the studios that do uh, across the across the world. So as a distributor uh, of, of independent cinema, we have to limit ourselves to Canada. I mean, we can do iTunes worldwide. We can turn on a switch, but um, I'm not in touch with a person in, 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 in Europe. Uh, I mean, you guys are. And that's what yeah, you guys are great that. at. Yeah. So, so for a traditional, call us a traditional yeah. distribution company. That's right. Um, we just couldn't afford it, but 
That is what that's we do. The, that's what she That is what we do. I mean, and some of the arguments, but again, it's like one of the things is we're not talking about the same films. Like it's really hard to say what's the trend in the film industry because the trend for Hollywood films is really different from the trend that from theatrically different high level art house films, which is what Elevation does, from the trend of what we do, which is uh, one level below Elevation in terms of general theatrical awareness that our films have. So on the one hand, that may be, um, I guess, a limitation, but we see it as a huge opportunity. Since most of the content we do does not hinge on a traditional theatrical push, we are... Um, I wouldn't say borderless, but we actually say to filmmakers and to sales agents, give us worldwide rights. Because we are not, for the majority of our content that we're working on, I am, it's not going to get all media rights buys in different territories. So again, you have to know what content you're working on. But most of our content, that is true. I am not going to go with our films and find someone in France or Germany that's going to want to buy all media rights on that content. It's just there is not enough meat on the bone for it. So for the filmmaker and for the sales agent, you're much better off having us handle worldwide rights between digital, whether it's Xbox or iTunes or Netflix or any of these, and TV sales, which we handle, you're getting 99% of the value that you would have gotten out of the world. This is a statement that is true for the content Film Buff works on. This is not true for all types of content. So well noticed, good question, but it's heavily caveated by what the content is. I think, too, if, if you think about the other way to think about it, you know, because everybody's been very fixated on Netflix for the last few months. And the, re the real thing is, the if you look at the system, forget Netflix for a second and, and OTT, because it's still a, a it's impactful, but it's still small. Um, if what's really critical and tied to borders um, are the tax credits that define a certain amount of um, Canadian ownership and control for a period of time over intellectual property. The, the CRTC rules that either require exhibition or a percentage of a broadcaster and cable company spending on uh, what, you know, things that are defined as Canadian production. The CMF rules that are, you know, six to 10 out of 10 type productions. The, the telephone, telefilm uh, rules, again, that focus very much on um, Canadian production and control and exploitation of IP and, and the control of exploitation and IP is going to be critical um, if Canadian companies are going to be able uh, to have an advantage um, in the digital world uh, in selling into global markets. Um, without those uh, protections, you would just have really, you could keep tax credits, but they'd be like the foreign location tax credit you would have service work the operate the the idea that you might actually be able to say to compete with hollywood or the, the uk um for that money and and those opportunities um and exploit ip would probably disappear uh i, I would think we would create a lot of uh, uh less work for canadian talent and see a lot of more creative people leaving the country so i think that you know, the, the, we miss that what we've got is still sustainable for a very long period of time, regardless or whether people, you know, focus on whether Netflix should be taxed or uh, have certain exhibition requirements. And that part, I think, the, the former part is way more important. And that's a wrap. We're about to get a hook here.